Hi there, and welcome to an online video lesson that's intended to provide you important principles and helpful information in your study of political communication. Now, in order to understand political communication, we have to have a better understanding of politics, and especially in the U.S. context, thinking about politics in terms of democracy and the democratic process is going to be very important for us. So this video lesson is intended to provide some clarification on what Richard Perloff describes in his textbook as three normative theories of democracy. In this lesson, we're going to cover, first of all, a basic understanding of what's generally meant by democracy. Then we need to understand what we actually mean by a normative theory so that we can actually then understand what's meant by normative theories of democracy. And then we'll outline the three most important theories that inform how we understand small d democratic politics today. Classical direct democracy, liberal democracy, and deliberative democracy. So what do we actually mean by democracy in the first place? When we want to define concepts, sometimes we go immediately to the dictionary. And so if we go to Merriam-Webster's, uh, we see the very first definition they provide is government by the people, especially rule of the majority. This very basic definition of democracy is in line with most of the primary assumptions about democracy ever since the term was invented, probably most popularized in the U.S. context by the classic quotation from Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, government of the people, by the people, for the people. This is a soundbite that most of us are familiar with, but we don't always necessarily reflect on it. The notion of government of the people means that people essentially are the ones who comprise the government. Government by the people means that the people themselves have constructed and created and implement, therefore, uh, the government. And for the people means that the government needs to serve in the people's interests. So in our contemporary context, what government of the people, by the people, for the people tends to mean is Merriam-Webster's second part of their definition, a government in which the supreme power is vested in the people and exercised by them directly or indirectly through a system of representation usually involving periodically held free elections. Okay, sounds very clear and uh, unmistakable, right? Well, things start getting a little bit weird when you look into this definition. Uh, folks that are down with their political theory might look at the second part of this second part of this definition and say, hey, wait a second, what they're talking about there isn't really democracy, that's a republic, a form of government in which representative people make the decisions on behalf of the people is in some ways not technically what is classically understood as a democracy. So we hear the United States referred to as a democracy. We hear it referred to as a republic. Most accurately, uh, U.S. government might be referred to as a democratic republic. And so things are starting to get messy. So what we can already find out about asking the question, what is democracy, is that that answer is really complicated. The notion of democracy itself involves contradictory public values. Uh, the values that we assume go along with a democracy have some internal tensions as well as external tensions between them. Think about the concept of freedom. Well, what does freedom mean? Does it mean freedom to do things that we want to do? What happens if our decision to do something ends up infringing on somebody else's freedom? Maybe it's freedom from other folks' actions or other kinds of institutions' actions. The notion of equality, that everyone is on some level the same. Well, what does that mean? Does everybody start out the same? Uh, is everyone guaranteed the same outcomes? And what happens when the free action of individuals might impinge on other people's equal treatment? Freedom and equality sometimes are at cross purposes. Democracy is generally understood as majority popular rule. We vote, we make decisions, and whatever the most people agree with, that's what we make into public policy. But does majority popular rule always mean that it's democratic when it might impinge on the rights or the quality of life of minority groups in a society? So majority rule and minority civil rights are sometimes at cross purposes.
Uh, democracies often understand themselves as involved in individual agency. In other words, individual people are able to act and make decisions and do things. But individual agency sometimes works across purposes with the community or the public good. Are people making decisions and exercising freedoms in and for themselves? Or is this supposed to be about what's good for a common society? So understanding small d democracy gets a little weird. And so what we need to do is understand before we go any further that defining democracy is a moving target. There are multiple definitions of democracy and the nature of what we understand as democracy is changing all the time. So because of this, we want to make sure that we have at our disposal intellectual frameworks for understanding what democracy is. This is where normative theory comes in. What's meant by normative theory? This might be a new concept for some of you. Perloff defines normative theory as theoretical accounts that prescribe or suggest what ought to be. Now, this word ought is going to be very important here because normative theory could be understood elsewise as a should theory. There's lots of different kinds of theories out there, right? If you think about hard science theories such as the theory of gravity or the theory of evolution, what we're talking about are theories regarding what is or how things happen based on evidence that establishes that there are relationships that when one thing happens that leads to something else happening as a matter of course. You might think about those kinds of theories as is theory. But normative theories are should theories. They're theories about what ought to be as opposed to what is. And so we're talking about the realm, not necessarily of hard science here, but the realm of ethics. Ethics can be easily understood as a philosophy of right action. And so when we're talking about normative theories of democracy, we're talking about theoretical accounts that prescribe or suggest what the right way to act ought to be in a form of government. Okay, so let's get at these normative theories. Uh, Perloff outlines three important ones that inform the way we understand our small d democratic form of government and politics today. Classical direct democracy, liberal democracy, and deliberative democracy. The first normative theory of democracy, classical direct democracy, is literally millennia old. We need to go back all the way to ancient Greece. And it's important to note when we're talking about ancient Greek history, we're not talking about one big country or nation, Greece. Greek city-states, uh, referred to as the polis, was the primary unit of government. So essentially, imagine a country the size of Columbia, Missouri, that would engage in their own self-government. And Athens was perhaps the most influential polis in uh, political theory and philosophy. All kinds of great things were going on in Athens with regard to philosophy and science and literature and theater. And in the 5th century BCE, the establishment of government by the assembly was perhaps the biggest contribution to political philosophy. The assembly was the legislature of Athens, and that's how they got their laws passed. And the city-state in general, and the assembly in particular, was the site of discussion and policy making where people would come together and make decisions about Athenian government. And the important thing to note here is that all Greek citizens were expected to participate directly in the assembly. The assembly would meet approximately 40 times a year, and all Greek citizens would come to the assembly, they would listen to arguments, and they would vote on public policy. And so this was motivated in large part by the core values of liberty or individual freedom and equality. All Greek citizens had a say. All Greek citizens had a vote in public policy. This was a direct response to earlier forms of government where basically the most rich and powerful and influential families got to say what went down. In this form of government, if you are a citizen, you are free to make your own choices, you have certain rights, and everybody has an equal shot in contributing to their government. And because of this equal opportunity for every citizen to get involved, Rhetoric or persuasive communication was vital to government. The key power was the ability to make one's case and to persuade other people that your idea was the best because that's the one that ultimately people would vote on. What's important to keep in mind, though, 
classical direct democracy in the Athenian polis was not universally free and equal. If you were a citizen, you had complete free and equal rights to participate. But in order to be a citizen, you had to be a guy, you had to be over 20 years of age, and you had to be a natural-born Athenian. Now, what this meant was if you were under 20, if you were a woman, if you were an immigrant, somebody who originally was born outside of Athens, and remember that in the geography of what we're talking about, that would be the rough equivalent of somebody from St. Louis who moved to Athens, right? And of course, if you were a slave, and interestingly enough, the population of slaves in Athens uh, far exceeded the number of citizens in Athens. Um, if you were in any of these groups, you were excluded from citizenship and therefore excluded from citizenship rights. You did not have a voice. You did not have a say. You did not get equal protection under the law. So this was by no means a perfect system. But classical direct democracy made a bunch of important contributions that inform the way we think about democratic government and politics today. All citizens were able to participate in the process, and this expectation resulted in a robust educational system for public life. If you were going to participate in the process of law and government, you needed to be able to communicate, and you needed to be able to understand and make decisions. And so education was a core virtue in Athenian life. Judgment on matters of public policy and the law was based on communication, rhetorical persuasion. And classical direct democracy in the Greek tradition embraced freedom and equality as core values. Now, of course, on the other side of the coin, all citizens were expected to participate in the political process. You didn't have an out just because you weren't interested or you had better things to do. If you were a Greek citizen, you had to show up and you had to participate. And the quorum for the Athenian assembly was 6,000 people. So, I mean, that's a really big meeting, right? Um, but everybody came together 40 times a year to make all the decisions. This is a system that doesn't scale past a small city. Can you imagine if all American citizens all had to come to the same meeting at the same time and vote on every single law? That just wouldn't fly. And again, remembering their core values, which are great core values, these didn't apply if you were under 20, if you were a woman, an immigrant, or a slave. So only certain people got to have the rights and privileges of citizenship. So that's classical direct democracy. Now, this tradition was very informative for the normative theory that came next. And to get a basic understanding of this, we want to flash forward to, well, let's call it 1776 and the founding of the United States of America. Liberal democracy is an outgrowth of 17th and 18th century theories and concepts, especially coming from England and France. This was a period that is known by historians as the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was an intellectual movement that featured reason and individualism. So uh, it was a response to uh, blindly following the traditions of the church and hereditary kings and monarchs and emperors. This intellectual movement said, we need to make decisions based not on superstitions or traditions, but based on our minds, on our intellect. So individual liberty and rationality were really important. And so contributions from science and contributions from the classics that were rediscovered during the Renaissance were really important to these folks. So they liked the Greek citizenship values of liberty and equality. It was very important to them, especially as they tried to imagine different forms of government from the monarchies they were used to. At the same time, because they were interested in rationality and logic and reason and science, they were really worried about what they perceived as the irrational mob. If you get too many people in a room together making decisions, they're not always going to make the most reasonable decisions. Uh, they were, in some ways, a bit distrustful of small-d democracy in the Greek direct tradition. So they looked to the Roman Republic. Uh, now, in the days before the Roman Empire, but after the dominance of Greece in uh, ancient culture, the Roman Republic was the dominant form of a uh, political system. And this was a representative government because Rome got too big to be directly uh, governed by all of the people getting together at a meeting. They decided to establish a representative government where leaders would be elected and those elected leaders would come together in an assembly and make the decision. 
Republicans. And then to implement the public policy, you couldn't just have all of those people collectively coming to a consensus that was far too messy. You won't get things done that way in a large country. So they developed the console system uh, of executive authority, roughly equivalent in some ways uh, to the kind of president that we have today. So liberal democracy it's important to note is liberalism not in the sense of how we understand liberals today in contemporary political philosophy. Liberalism comes from the tradition of classical citizenship from the Greeks and Romans. What does this mean? Well, it means that the core values coalesced around liberty, individual rights, autonomous action, and what uh, many have referred to as the private sphere. Uh, John Locke, for instance, came up with a relatively famous formulation of the basic rights under liberalism, life, liberty, and property, that was amended in the Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We're talking about rights of individual people to live, uh, to make the your own decisions as an individual person to own property and do with that property what you will and to make decisions and actions in your life that are going to lead to self-satisfaction so it's a very individual approach to freedom and they believe that these rights were natural. Some of these thinkers thought that these rights came from God. Some of them who weren't exactly religious people believe that these were rights that came from the state of nature and evolved as human beings evolved. But the important place where they came together was that rights are not something that's a privilege that's granted to you by government. Once you are born, you have these rights, period. And that's what classical liberalism was all about. Liberal democracy also involves representative government because they were worried that, well, while all people are created equal, uh, not necessarily everybody is in a position to make the best decisions. So they were really worried about direct democracy. So instead, the philosophy behind representative government assumed that educated, virtuous elites would be chosen by the people to govern on their behalf based on small d democratic ideas. And so this is where the idea uh, of the Congress comes from, uh, based on the Roman assembly of the Republic era. The third key tenet of liberal democracy is a notion of the marketplace of ideas. The small L liberals and the small D democracy of the Enlightenment really emphasized the importance of free and open communication. They believed, as the Greeks and Romans did, on the force of the better argument. So they believed that freedom of speech and freedom of the press was absolutely essential in order for people to know what was going on and be able to make decisions in how to govern themselves and how to select the leaders uh, that would take them forward. So the strengths of liberal democracy include a presumption that natural rights were inherent to the human condition. So freedom and equality was something that everyone was entitled to, and it wasn't something that's gifted by government. The thought that you have a popular government that also has an organized structure and expertise that would be able to scale as a nation grew larger is a really important idea. And the notion of free information and ideas being central to the freedoms that we enjoy is something that's a really important contribution from Enlightenment liberal democracy. However, on the other side of the coin, there were some drawbacks. Uh, the notion that you needed to have an elite leadership and constrained democracy. So you wanted government of, by, and for the people, but you didn't want that to get out of hand. So we had early assumptions, for instance, that the Senate would be elected by state legislatures and not by the people. That uh, the president would be selected by electors who were selected by state governments and not by the people. We wanted democracy, just not too much. And this individualist emphasis on natural rights meant that there was a possibility that minority group interests and needs could really get the shaft. This was something that favored majority and elite rule, and the assumption was that all people being created equal means that nobody could possibly complain that they didn't have access to the same opportunities as everyone else. Now that's a bit ironic given that their core values were also limited in the same ways that Greek citizenship was. If you were young, you didn't count. If you were a woman, an immigrant, a slave, you were originally excluded from citizenship rights. 
Now, immigrants, uh, this is a, well, what do you mean? There were lots of immigrants in the uh, U.S. Uh, democratic tradition. Yes, that's true, but there was also a really big tradition of getting to decide who was going to have voting rights and who didn't. So liberal democracy had its drawbacks as well as its strengths. Now, these kinds of drawbacks along the lines of particular groups being excluded from the process really informed the third and final normative theory that we need to think about. And that's one that I think is typified in the town hall meeting. If you've ever been to a town hall meeting, this is something that is not by any stretch the elite leadership model of democracy. This is the model where folks get together, they hear from their representatives, but they also have their say. They converse, they debate, sometimes it's heated, but most times it's civil, folks get together and form the public policy that is going to inform what they're doing. This is not direct democracy. This isn't everybody having a vote on everything, but this is the people having a clear say through discussion on what their leaders are going to do. Now, this is a set of theories that develops throughout the 20th century, especially theories from the uh, philosopher John Rawls, who had uh, a philosophical theory of justice that was very important, uh, and the uh, social theorist uh, from Germany, Jürgen Habermas, who developed a theory of the public sphere that's really important to the way we understand deliberative democracy. The idea here from many of these thinkers was a critique of what has often been referred to and is still referred to as neoliberalism. So this idea of classical liberalism that came from the Enlightenment has the potential to really go too far. If you have too much focus on the freedoms of individuals in the private sphere, uh, the freedom to own property and do what you want to with that property, economically speaking, doesn't necessarily provide us with a sufficient focus on the common good. Uh, people, for instance, who don't have property and therefore don't have access to lots of things like a high quality of life and education, health care, etc., etc., you can't just necessarily assume that they have the same opportunities that everybody else has. So maybe we need to dial back on the individualism a little bit in order to focus on the common good. A related piece to this is that over-reliance on elected officials means that citizens are going to be somewhat disconnected from the process of governance. If elected representatives are making all the decisions and passing all of the rules, then whoever it is that influences those elected officials is going to have an outsized amount of power. So we need to think about a model of democracy that is going to empower citizens and make sure that they have an opportunity to influence and guide those that they've elected to lead them. And so when we're thinking about de deliberative democracy, an important concept here, and this one comes from Habermas uh, mentioned earlier, the public sphere, that there is this space that exists between the state or between the country's government on the one hand and individual private lives on the other hand, family, workplace, etc. The public sphere exists between that state and that private sphere, and this is where public opinion develops. Uh, this was an idea that Habermas went all the way back to the days of the Enlightenment. It wasn't just about the, the, the folks that we elected to Congress, for instance, but it was the discussions that took place in places like literary clubs and salons and coffee houses where people would talk and discuss and debate. And it was in these conversations where people informed themselves about what was going on and they made that public opinion known to those who were involved in government. So deliberation is a key part of the process of public life, exercising practical judgment after considering the issues through discussion. And deliberation itself is a concept that we can go all the way back to the days of classical Greece to find its origins. Folks like Aristotle, for instance, referred to the concept of phronesis, or practical wisdom, which would get talked about a lot during the Enlightenment era as the concept of prudence. In other words, making practical judgment under circumstances where you don't necessarily have all of the absolutely true answers, and conditions are probabilistic and contingent on other kinds of variables. We need to make decisions. We're not always sure whether or not those decisions will absolutely be the right decision, 
but we've still got to make a decision anyway. So in order to engage in prudential judgment, we need to engage in deliberation, reasoned argument, weighing the arguments on both sides before we come to a decision forms the basis of discursive judgment. If we deliberate in the public sphere, we can make the best kinds of decisions that form our public opinion and then transmit those public opinions to those who are leading us in government. Now, you might imagine some of the strengths of deliberative democracy. There's an emphasis on citizen power and citizen agency. Agency essentially means the capacity to make decisions and to act in a way that's efficacious, in a way that accomplishes something. Deliberative democracy also has an emphasis on the collective good. We're not ignoring individual rights at all, but we're also saying that we need to think about ourselves not just as individuals, but as a community, as a collective public. And civil discourse provides the basis for public action that preserves our rights. We get together, we engage in conversation and discussion, and that forms the basis of our action, not the disconnected decisions of elites that are removed from the rest of us. However, there's often been disagreements over the role of so-called private interests in public life. Now, on the one hand, we don't want people making decisions just because it's going to line their pocketbook. On the other hand, making distinctions between public and private have historically been used, for instance, to deny women certain rights or to deny people certain rights or uh, opportunities based on things like race or ethnicity or sexual orientation, because those are matters of private identity and concern, not matters over what counts for everybody in the public sphere. There's also been a disagreement over whether or not civility or civil discourse is always the way to go. Think, for instance, about the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Getting opportunities for equal protection under the law for African Americans didn't happen just because people got together and talked about it. It also happened through the process of civil disobedience, of the systematic breaking of the law in public, uh, led by leaders such as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that drew attention to issues that subsequently then civil discourse could engage in public policy over. Civility is sometimes seen as an opportunity to put a damper on more direct action when direct action is necessary. Related to this, the idea that democracy is dependent on deliberation means that other kinds of decision making is seen as not necessarily as legitimate. Uh, sometimes we need to engage in direct action if our voice all by itself isn't being heard. Uh, but folks that emphasize civility might say, well, that's not legitimate. That's not the way we go about change. On the other side of the coin, there are certain kinds of decision-making moments, for instance, when presidents need to make uh, quick decisions regarding national security issues, especially if they might require secrecy in order to keep people safe. This is sometimes distrusted as well because, hey, we're supposed to be talking about these things. You can't have presidents just going off and making decisions, even though sometimes that kind of decision-making can be kind of important. So deliberative democracy isn't perfect either, but it's really got a lot of strengths that pull from the other two normative theories of democracy we've talked about in order to protect the rights and privileges of individuals as well as pursue the common good. So if we were to summarize these theories uh, in a way that Richard Perloff does in his textbook, we might do so as follows. All right, so understanding these three normative theories of democracy can really give you a good context for figuring out why and how the political communication we use today operates the way that it does, and it gives us a basis for evaluating this political communication from an ethical perspective. What kind of democracy ought we have as citizens? If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next online lesson.